Thank you very much, Helen. Great to see you all this evening. Real treat to be spending Sunday evening with you. Please do keep that passage open. And our theme this evening, the subject that we're going to be talking about this evening, is leadership. And I always feel slightly conscious as a church leader talking about leadership. It's not very British to sort of talk about yourself for 20 minutes. But anyway, that's what we're going to be doing this evening. But hopefully it comes as no surprise to you if you were here last week that that's what we're talking about this evening. If you, if you missed last week, basically we said the same four words on loop for about 20 minutes. Uh, truth leads to godliness. If you weren't here last week, that's you caught up on everything you missed. Truth leads to godliness. Um, if you have a look down at 1 verse 12, we said last week that Cretan society is famously evil and it's famously um, immoral. An international reputation for being liars, evil brutes and lazy gluttons. And then Paul just adds that nice little line, this saying is true, just to really rub it in. And so to change the world, to clean up Crete, to turn around a whole society, what's the strategy? Truth leads to godliness. Truth teaches, clean up Crete and lead to godly living. And so, well, hopefully the logic of where Paul goes next is just really compelling and really obvious. Because if the great need on, on, on Crete is truth, truth leads to godliness, cleans up the islands. Well, what does Paul need to talk about next? Well, pretty obviously, he needs to talk about truth teachers. That's the great need. That's what he needs to talk about. Do you see the logic is absolutely relentless, isn't it? Truth leads to godliness. What do you need to talk about? Truth teachers. I've got some points up there. Problem is, though, as soon as I say the subject this evening is leadership half of you have switched off immediately and you think well this is relevant to Ben and maybe my home group leader and one or two other people but actually it's got nothing to say to me well if that's how you're thinking just come with me to the very last verse of the letter where Paul says this uh, just the last verse of the letter he says everyone with me sends you greetings greet those who love us in the faith grace be with you all and what you need to notice there do you see it there are two yous in those verses two yous The first one is singular. Everyone with me sends you greetings, you Titus. Here's a letter written to a church leader. Here's a letter written to Titus. But then the second one, grace be with you all. That one's plural. And I think that tells you something very significant about Paul's expectation as we read through this letter. Yes, it's a letter written to a church leader, but his expectation is that you all, plural, whole church, are listening in on these instructions to Titus so that you know what kind of ministry turns around Crete and turns around Oakwood, so that you know what kind of ministry to encourage, so that you know what kind of leadership to back. So when your church leader says, come on, we're going to do this thing now, this is what we're going to do, you know what kind of ministry to get beyond and to, uh, to back and support. And in particular, if you have a look at verse 5, it tells you one of the things that your church leader should be very, very concerned about. One of the big concerns of any church leader should be to see truth teachers in every town up and down the island of Crete, every town up and down the island of Britain. And that's got to be right, hasn't it? Got to be right. Because if the way you turn around a culture is by getting truth into that culture to lead to godliness, well, what's the big need? You need truth teachers. Ben's been saying it all evening. We need to be taught. So we've got two points. They're on the screen. Uh, where we're going this evening, two points. Point one, leaders must be gripped by the truth. What are the hallmarks of authentic Christian leadership? What should you look for? If ever you move house and move away from London, what should you look for in a future church? What should you look for in a future church leader? Or if um, for future church leaders, what should you look for? Uh, Potential one verse five people, leaders of the future. What should you look for? Well, we said it last week. Verses six and seven and eight. What's the key mark of the church leader? Godliness. Because truth and godliness are connected. How do you find out if someone's got the truth? How do you find out if someone's qualified to teach? Well, look at their lives. Because if truth leads to godliness, has, has the truth gripped their lives? 
Has it shown godly living in their character? Has it shown godly living in their family life? Now, I don't think there is anything particularly special about verses 6 to 8. I don't think this is anything um, out of the ordinary. This is just normal Christian godliness. It ought to be descriptive of every Christian man and woman in the room this evening. Here's why it's so key for a church leader, I think. Because the consequences of scandal are so much more damaging to the church. And I think if you want an illustration of that, I think the best place to go is the Roman Catholic Church in Ireland. Why is it that within a generation, the Roman Catholic Church in Ireland has emptied? Why is it that people have lost confidence in the institution? Well, I don't want to be reductionistic, and I'm sure there are many reasons, but could anything be to do with the child sex scandals? People saying, if my priest does this... If my priest does this, is there anything in their message? If this is how they live, if this is how they behave, they've disqualified themselves as a teacher. Consequences of scandal are so damaging. That's why godliness really matters. Every tabloid newspaper in the country works with this connection, truth and godliness. You disqualify yourself as a teacher if your life doesn't match up uh, with your teaching. But we're not talking about perfection here. So the word in in verse 6, blameless, that doesn't mean perfect. Doesn't mean, um, yeah, it doesn't mean kind of uh, does nothing wrong. We're talking about a pattern of godliness. Is, uh, Is that church leader the sort of person who puts the gospel at risk? Uh, Verse 7, have they got a temper on them? Uh, What are they like with money? Uh, Verse 7 again, what are they like with um, alcohol? If uh, you ask the people that they live with, what what would they say about them? What are they like with confidential information? Have they got a weakness for self-glory? And in particular, the verse 6 question, see the verse 6 question there, is whether the truth has impacted the home life of a Christian minister. Because Because the home is a pretty good indicator of whether someone's qualified to lead in a wider sphere of responsibility. How are you doing with the responsibilities that God has already given you? Because that's a pretty good indicator of whether someone's qualified to deal with a bigger responsibility. And so Titus needs to be asking some pretty big questions. Are they faithful? Are they committed? Are they in it for the long term? Uh, Does he have a history of flirting? Is he above reproach? Do members of the opposite sex feel safe, feel comfortable um, in their company? Now, just very quickly, just to pause and just say a couple of quick things in square brackets, if I may. First, to state the obvious, I don't think verse 6 is saying that you have to be married to be a Christian leader. That can't be right, because Paul's single. I think the Bible's talking about um, probably a norm, probably an expectation rather than a requirement. Uh, It can't be saying that you have to be um, married to be a church leader. Secondly, and this is slightly more controversial, I guess, you might have some big questions about Paul's use of the masculine pronoun all the way through the passage in connection with the church leader. And I just wanted to say, uh, when he he keeps talking about the he, he, he being the church leader, I just want to say that if if that's the most sexist thing you think you've ever heard, please do come and chat to me afterwards. Paul is massively pro-women's ministry. He's massively, uh, massively pro-women. But he just seems to think that overall church leadership is uh, reserved for men only. But as I say, please don't get angry with Paul for saying that. Don't get angry with the Bible. Please uh, pick it up in question time afterwards. Let's have a chat. I think, actually, uh, when when we look at it, when we understand Paul's reasons behind it, when we really get the Bible's teaching on gender, I think we find it surprisingly persuasive and surprisingly liberating. Anyway, end of square brackets, because the next part of the uh, the test is the the next part of the family test um, is all about children. Do you see it there in verse 6? So an elder must be blameless, he must be blameless, faithful to his wife, and then a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Have you ever heard about the, um, have you ever heard of the American preacher, John Piper? Getting some nods. John Piper, he's quite a famous kind of American preacher, Leader. He retired quite recently, and it was really interesting when the church was trying to appoint his successor as part of that interview process. The interview panel actually went to live with the families 
of the, of the candidates, the potential future wannabe John Pipers, the, uh, the candidates. Now, um, as an interview, that, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Looking at verse 6. So you can answer the verse 6 questions really close up. The wardens didn't do that with me, um, thankfully. But um, you, know, you, you need to answer the verse 6 questions. What was he like? What was the wannabe John Piper like when little Archie threw his Weetabix across the breakfast table? Did, you know, did, he, did, he, did he respond? Did he react to that? What about 3 o'clock in the morning when Jemima wet the bed for the fifth time that week? Um, how did he respond? Now, as, a, um, as an interview process, that, that seems to make a lot of sense. Um, as a church leader, it's absolutely terrifying. Um, it's always a bit embarrassing when it's your children who are the worst behaved um, on, a Sunday, uh, on a Sunday morning. Um, but I don't think this is saying that young children have to be perfect. Uh, neither do I think, if you look at it, neither do I think it's saying that we need to go around and interview the beliefs of every single child um, in the family. Uh, rather, the question is, what is the overall trajectory of the family? Are the parents committed to teaching the truth? Is there evidence of godly living? Is there evidence of truth leading to godliness in this family? Uh, and of course, people often ask lots of questions about the, uh, the, the thing of uh, a man whose children believe. But again, there's a world of difference, isn't there, between the young child under the parent's authority and the teenager who's, who's grown up to make their own decisions. Uh, the wider point, the wider point is that family life is a great training ground for bigger responsibilities. Has the truth gripped the home life? Has the truth led to godliness in the family? But maybe you're someone here this evening as a potential one verse five person. There might be a potential future one verse five person in the room. You haven't got a family and you're thinking, well, how does this all apply to me? You know, I haven't got children. How does this apply to me? Well, I think even though your context might be different, Actually, the principle is the same. Uh, whether, whether you have a family or whatever the sphere of responsibility that God has already given you. How, how are you doing with the responsibilities that God has already given you? That would be a great test for whether you're able to cope with wider responsibilities. But you see also, it's not just whether the truth has gripped you. It's also verse 9, isn't it? Verse 9 not just has the truth grip you but do you have a grip on the truth because if you look at verse 9 I think here is the job description now at this point you're probably thinking here we go again I knew if I came to St Thomas's tonight they'd they'd end up teaching about the Bible they'd end up teaching you know it's all about Bible teaching and preaching but have a look at verse 9 there's the job description there's not a lot else in there actually is there let me just give you a quick survey of some of the, the, the verbs in this letter. This is what Paul says Titus is to do. Here's, the, here's basically the job description. Here are the verbs. We get silence, rebuke, teach, encourage, encourage, rebuke, remind. Do you see the emphasis on truth teaching? Here's the job description. So the, the church leader is, is not particularly to seek out the best comedians or the, uh, the wizziest communicators or the most engaging speakers. Of course, those things are really important. But the main thing, do you see at verse 9? Do they have a passion for the truth? Is he the sort of person who's going to stick at it? Is he the sort of person who's going to hold firmly to the truth? Are they the sort of reliable person who's going to defend sound doctrine? Um, I happened to be on Facebook the other day and... Um, uh, a job description popped up from a church in Utah. Now, don't worry, I'm not thinking about leaving already. I was just, just uh, knocking around on Facebook. And uh, this advert really struck me because the job descriptions of these things normally say things like entrepreneur, dynamic personality, people person. Of course, all those things are really important in a church leader. But this, uh, this one particularly leapt out of me because it basically said, we want people to teach us the Bible and we don't want people to tell us what we want to hear and affirm us. We want people, someone to teach us what we don't want to hear and to challenge us. And that's verse 9, isn't it? There's the job description. Hold firmly to the truth. So Titus, don't look for novelty, but look for someone who's going to hold fast. And uh, in an age of create, uh, creativity and innovation, I'm aware that sounds really boring. That sounds really dull. But that is the only hope godless creeds because it's truth that leads 
to godliness. Okay, so point one, truth teachers must be gripped by the truth. Here's the, um, here's the second part of the job description, because do you see how verse nine continues? You've not just got to hold firmly to the truth to encourage, but also hold firmly to the truth to refute those who oppose it. So point two, truth teachers must be opposed to untruth. Verse 10, for there, there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. Uh, they must be silenced because they're disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Now, it's not absolutely clear what these false teachers in Crete are teaching, but we get some clues. We get a few clues. Just have a, a look down at a few of them. So verse 10, she there talks about the circumcision group. And then, uh, where is it? The Jewish... Um, have a look at verse 14, the Jewish myths, human commands. Verse 15 seems to talk about um, legalistic fussiness. What gets these guys up in the morning? What, what really gets the, the blood pumping for these guys? Human religion. Adding self-made rules to the gospel. And the irony is, of course, you'd probably look at these people with all their rules and all their religion and you'd think, wow, impressive. They, they look really, really keen. But Paul says the opposite. He's, he's actually quite rude about them, isn't he? Do you see the word there in verse 10, that rebellious word? That's actually the same word as he used in verse 6 of the, uh, of the wild and disobedient children. So think of this larchy throwing his Weetabix over the, um, over the breakfast table. That's the word he uses of the false teachers. And then isn't it interesting, this quote that we spent lots of time on last week in verse 12 about Cretan culture, who does he apply it to? In what context does the quote come? It's all about the false teachers. Because they've so lost the truth that they've just blended in with Cretan culture. You can't tell the difference anymore. And then verse 16, Ben, ben referred to it earlier, they claim to know God's, but by their actions, they deny him. Isn't this interesting? More religious, less godly. Isn't that interesting? More religious, less godly. And if you were here last week, hopefully that makes sense because we said last week it's the truth that leads to godliness. If you've got untruth, if you've got wrong truth, well, that's just going to lead to wonky living doesn't work human religion self-made rules doesn't work and, and you'll know that to be true in your own experience I think so if you've ever tried to control the body by human rules you'll know it doesn't work so you think to yourself don't you well um if I try and control the body by moving the laptop downstairs or by never watching the 18. There might be some wisdom in those human rules, but it can't stop me from sinning because the 15 can still have the same effect on me. Or I can just go downstairs and use the laptop. Human rules have some wisdom, but actually no power to change. Just self-made religion. The other danger is that they reduce the standards of godliness. They reduce godliness to a box-ticking exercise. So I've been circumcised, verse 10. I've done the circumcision. God's pleased with me. So I can just crack on and do what I like with the boys on a Friday night. All right, maybe I've made a rule. I'm not going to drink alcohol. Kept the rule, box tick, God's pleased with me. So it doesn't really matter what I do with the expense form at work. Or I've given up chocolate for Lent. Great, God's pleased with me. But I'll just crack on in a different area. Can you see, all they've done is just box ticking. It just lowers the demands of godliness. God's pleased with me. God's pleased with me. Actually, more religious less godly. And Paul thinks this is really, really serious. The word disrupt there in verse 11, that's quite weak as a translation when he says um, they've disrupted whole households. That's really weak, that translation. The word there is destroy, ruin. It's not just that the, uh, the internet connection's been disrupted and the kids can't do their homework anymore. No. Destroyed. Religious destruction. 
less godly. And so what is the command then to the church leader? What, what sort of ministry should you back? What sort of church leader should you look for? Well, here's the command to the church leader. Refute, silence, rebuke. And I'm aware that in an age of good disagreement and plural truth, uh, that is quite a big deal thing to say. In an age that loves to affirm everything that everybody says, you know, that, is, that is quite a big thing, isn't it, for Paul to say. Do we, um, do we even believe do we even believe in false teaching? Do we even believe that there might be church leaders out there who teach untruth? In a, in a postmodern world, do we even believe in such a category as false truth? It was John Calvin who was the, um, the famous 16th century reformer. He, he said very famously that the church leader needs to have two voices. One voice to encourage the sheep and another voice to warn away the thieves and the wolves. And that's verse 9, isn't it? The two aspects of the job description. Hold on to the truth to encourage. Hold on to the truth to refute. Isn't this striking? Isn't this striking? Half of my job description is to be negative, verse 9. Isn't that striking? And so here's the question. Will you back your church leader in this? Now you know the job description. Now you know what they're meant to be doing. Will you support them? Will you back them? Nobody wants disagreement. Nobody enjoys confrontation. But this is the God-given rule of the truth teacher. Why? Why is this so important? Well, because the truth's at stake and truth leads to godliness. Take away the truth, there's no godliness. No power to change creeds. So truth teachers must be gripped by the truth. Truth teachers must be opposed to untruth. Let me finish by telling you one of my favourite stories, I think, from the 16th century Reformation. Again, it's about John Calvin and what happened to him when he was, um, he was exiled from Geneva. Uh, it's a story about what happened when he returned to the city. So you may know that Geneva was the great powerhouse of the 16th century Reformation, but people forget that Calvin's time in the city was, was pretty rocky. It was pretty turbulent. He was um, exiled from the city several times. He was, he was persecuted. He was sent away. Here's what happens when, um, when he returns to the city after one of his exiles. And you can imagine, can't you, the air being thick with anticipation as, uh, as he climbs back into his old pulpit after three years away. If you like, the congregation, they brace themselves for the torrent of anathemas that's surely going to follow from an embittered deportee finally given a public voice. That's how Calvin had been treated. Do you want to know what he does? He just picks up the exposition from where he left off three years earlier, from the very next verse. Isn't that brilliant? No agenda, no personal agenda, no vendettas, no revenge, just verse nine. Hold fast the truth to encourage the sheep to warn away the thieves and the wolves. Titus, uh, Paul says to Titus, verse 5, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left at finished and appoint elders in every town. Elders who hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and so that he can refute those who oppose it. Truth teachers, what do you look for in a church leader? What kind of ministry are you going to back? What kind of ministry are you going to encourage? What kind of ministry are you going to get behind? What are the hallmarks of a genuine Christian leader? Gripped by truth, godly life, opposed to untruth. Because truth leads to godliness. Truth changes the world. Truth even cleans up godless creeds. Um, I'm going to pray and then, um, and then back over to bed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we we pray the one verse five prayer and long that you might um, send out laborers into your harvest field all over this country. We pray uh, that in every town, every village, every city up and down this island, that you might have uh, Christian leaders, truth teachers like the ones here in this passage who will teach the truth. And we don't pray that just because we love a bit of knowledge and we love a bit of information. And we love stuffing our head full of uh, Bible facts. But we pray that because the knowledge of the truth leads to godliness. We long to see this country 
uh, turned into a godly country living your way. And we pray it for your glory. Amen. We're going to have a chance to ask Rich some questions, if we'd like to, to clarify um, or to just help us apply this to ourselves. Let me start you off, if that's all right. You can be thinking of a good question. Um, As people get to know me, or they have done, probably they'll see lots of flaws in my character. Probably the same with you over the next (laughs) month. Um, That's the way it is, because we're sinners. Um, what would you say to us, you know, if someone sees in my character a great flaw and they think, well, well in that case, I, I really don't have to listen to what Ben's saying on a Sunday because I know, what, I know what he did and I know how he got angry that time or whatever it is. Thanks, man. That's a really helpful question. And it is, it's very interesting, isn't it? Because I think this is something that holds us all back from stepping up to any kind of leadership in the church. We think, I can only start serving. I can only start doing something for God and start serving when my life is perfect. You know, I'll start serving in 20 years' time and I've sorted out this problem in my life. But obviously, the, stand, the, the, the standard of um, service, what God's looking for in a leader, is not perfection. Because if God only used perfect people, well, then none of us would be here and no one would ever serve him. And you see this, don't you, all the way through Bible history. You read through uh, the Old Testament, the New Testament. Who does God use to do his work? Well, someone like Paul he murdered Christians. Isn't that interesting? He uses sinners. That's, that's how he works. Um, and as I said, this is not, um, blameless doesn't mean perfect, but it will mean a trajectory, um, a trajectory of life. I think that he was, um, as a leader, it's helpful, isn't it? I think my, my three-year-old had a tantrum this morning, and I think most of the parents in the congregation were absolutely relieved about that. Mm-hmm. You know, um, actually, the vicar's family is no different to our family. It's just, just normal life. Yeah. I don't, you add something to that as well, Ben. What do you... What would you say? That's great. Yeah. Thanks. I'm off the hook. Um, ask a question. Who else would like to ask a question? Helen. Godly. It's interesting if you have a look at verse 1, it says the knowledge of the truth leads to godliness. And when you see the word knowledge in the Bible, it's rarely, knowledge is rarely just a sort of intellectual thing. The word knowledge carries lots of aspects to it. So it's, um, it's a relational knowledge. It's, a, um, it's an inclinational knowledge. It's an emotional knowledge. Knowledge isn't just a mind thing. It's much more than that in the Bible. And so I think Thinking it in that way really helps, I think, with answering that question because we think of it as a, as a relational knowledge, then that leads to godliness. It's about loving someone, being in relationship with them, wanting, therefore, to, to please them. Um, I think of a marriage um, and how two people spend time together and grow together and become more like each other and it changes them because it's a relational knowledge. So it's, um, it's the knowledge of a person knowing somebody, wanting to please them, being gripped by that and pleasing them. Do you want to... Wanna... Yeah, so, so is it possible then that I, or someone, could, could know the exact truth of the gospel, if you, know, if you can define it that way, know all the doctrine and teach it really clearly and yet still be ungodly? Is that possible? I think the letter of James that we're going to be studying um, after Titus, I think, effectively says that, doesn't it? Even the, um, even the demons... Uh, believe that there is one God. You know, they've got all the answers. It doesn't make them godly. Um, sadly, you can sit in church your whole life and the truth doesn't lead to godliness. But it's, it's more than just a mind knowledge, isn't it? It grips your heart. Yeah. I don't know, is that, does that help? Yeah. I'm sure there's more to say. So it's that relationship of actually it moving you to trust in Jesus as your saviour, that kind of thing. Trust in the grace that leads, yeah, okay. Good question. Would anyone else like to ask a final question? Mr. Flink. Uh, so you wouldn't say it's more knowledge as we get, the more religious we get. So that knowledge would also be religious. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm just trying to tell me what's behind that question. So, more, more knowledge, more religious. I think that, as I said, the, um, the, the, there's a danger of com- compartmentalization effectively here, where we, um, we think we've pleased God in one area of life, and therefore it's okay to crack on in another, another area of life. And, uh, and that one thing comes to sort of dominate so much that that's the only thing I think of in terms of my, my sin and my godliness. Um, and I guess what, 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 what Paul's wanting, this list here in verses 6 to 8, is all-encompassing, not just one area. And I guess the danger of these sort of religious false teachers is that they're just... Circumcision seems to be the thing, Jewish laws. Um, but he says, verse 12, they're liars, they're evil brutes, they're lazy gluttons. And I think that's just very interesting. So they look the parts, but actually they're verse 12. Um, so real knowledge of the truth will lead, to, will lead to godliness in all areas. Not just some box ticking to please God, limiting the demands. Um, yeah, that, that's what happens if I take away the gospel, take away the knowledge of the truth. I'll just try and, um, try and be religious, try and please God by going to church once a week, but doing what I want the rest of the week. Um, but the gospel will transform me from the inside and make, make me godly in all sorts of ways. Sorry, it's probably a rubbish answer to your question. But yeah, there we go. They've been great questions. Now, if we do it again, you must ask some really rubbish questions as well because it's okay to ask silly questions. You know, like, why is the full stop there? Or what does this word mean? Or something. That's fine. Thank you, Rich. Uh, we're going to sing our final song. And um, it's a song you... you